Well, as we get started this morning, we are in the second, or I'm sorry, the third week of a study titled, What's in a Name? Now, through this study, we've been looking at uh, certain figures in the Bible, uh, certain folks who uh, we hear about their stories, um, you know, who they were, what they did, what happened to them. Uh, we learn how their stories unfolded, how their lives changed, and we also learn something very interesting about the particular people we're studying. We learn that at some point along the way, their name was changed, right? So we learn how God brought changes into their lives or changes into their stories, how he brought about changes in them as people, <coughs> and we see that sometimes... As he brought those changes, also, there was another change, a change in their name. So that's what we're focusing on. Last week was Abraham and Sarah, and this week we'll be looking at Jacob and Esau. Well, one of the things that um, I'd like to, to point out is that uh, as a church, we have been trying to understand who we are, uh, what God is doing with us. And we've been in a period of change over the last year uh, with uh, Steve, who was the pastor here, retiring, with me coming on board, with some new things happening in the life of the church. And so we as a church have been seeing that God may be doing something new here. He may be doing something different here. And we're really considering uh, what does this mean for us? Right? So, as we focus in on how God changes people's stories, how he brings about something new for them, I'd like for us also to consider the life of our church. What is God doing here that is new or is different? What ministry is he calling us into that we may not have been involved in before? Well, before we go any further this morning, uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for everyone who's here. But thank you that you're God. Thank you that you are the only one who is God. Thank you that you love us, that you know us, and that you come to us. Thank you for sending the Son, Jesus Christ, to us so that we can come back to you, so that we can know you, so that we can know who we are supposed to be. Help us to understand who you are. Help us to understand what you are doing and what you have done. Help us to understand who we can be, who you are making us into, because you know, even before we were born, even before you formed us in our mother's wombs, you knew who we would be. You knew the identity that we would have in you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Bless our time today, Lord. Help me to deliver your word faithfully. Amen. Help us to give ourselves to you completely. And Lord, let all that we do here be honoring to you. And let it bring glory to you. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right, well, as I mentioned, this morning we're going to be looking at the story of Jacob and Esau, and this is a story that we find in the book of Genesis. Uh, specifically, we're going to be uh, spanning a, a, a section of Genesis that runs roughly from chapter 25 to 33. The story of Jacob and Esau actually goes through the end of chapter 36. You may say, wow, that's a whole lot of the Bible to cover. Well, just be prepared to be here for a while. All right? <laughs> so, uh, what I'd like to do is, is kind of point out that uh, I'm going to tell the story of Jacob and Esau, right? So, we're not going to read word for word, uh, you know, chapters 25 through 33, but we are going to cover the story of their lives, the events and the things that happened to them. And we're going to slow down in a few areas to focus on some major passages. All right, and those will be up here on the screen. 
Uh, you can also uh, turn to them in your Bible as we get there. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you'll find one in the seat pocket in front of you. Uh, it's the white book uh, that you'll see there. And uh, you're happy to, or, um, you know, you're welcome to follow along as we go. Now, as we approach this story, there are a few questions that I'd like to ask and answer that kind of help us get a feel for what it is that we're doing, uh, what it is that we're approaching here in the Bible. And uh, the first one is this. Now, you guys who may have been here last week will remember these questions because basically the stories that we're looking at are the same kinds of stories. And so I want to point out the kind of story this is. This is a combination of history and biography. Right? It's a combination of history and biography. We get some dates, we get some facts, we get some historical information here. We also get the story of Jacob and Esau's life. We get some information about who they were as people, right? We get some information about what happened to them, how they understood it, and how we ourselves should understand it. And that's kind of the point of biography, right? is not just to tell you who a person was, but to tell you how to understand that person's life. <coughs> so that's what we're looking at here. <coughs> well, the second question that I'd like to ask and answer, and if you're in the bulletin, uh, you'll see that these are printed here, uh, so you can follow along that way, and you can write down some notes if you like to. But the second question is, who is it intended for? Who is this story for? Well, originally it was intended for the Hebrew people. Now, that's the nation of Israel as we know them in the Bible. These are the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. These are the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob is a person who we're going to look at today. These people became the nation of Israel. And so we have here some of their history some of their history as a family, some of their history as a people, as a country. It tells the story of what great-great-great-grandma, great-great-great-grandpa, uh, and so forth, what, who these different people were and what they did. How did we come to be a people? But that's not all. That's not the only group of people this was intended for. Because where do we find this story? In the Bible. In the Bible. And who is the Bible for? Us. Everybody who comes in contact with it. Right? The Bible is for everybody who comes in contact with it. So this is a story not only for them, but it's also a story for us. And we may want to ask another question. What is the point? What is the point of this story? Well, it's to tell us something, as we mentioned, about Jacob and Esau's lives. It's to tell us something also about God, right? It's to tell us how God interacted with Jacob and Esau. It's to tell us what God did, what he was doing to them, what he was doing through them, how they, came, how they understood that, how they came to know him, right? And it tells us how we should understand God better by seeing how he has worked in their lives. Because there are some similarities here, right? We want to understand our relationship to God by seeing his relationship to them. And we want to understand that the stories of people like this that we encounter in the Bible are stories that should help us see how God works in our lives, how God is at work in the world, right? And that times and circumstances may be different today than they were 4,000 years ago, right, or 2,000 years ago, or even 100 years ago. But God is unchanging. And 
our <coughs> situations as human people tend to be the same age over age. We have the same struggles, we have the same problems, uh, and God comes to us and reveals himself to us many times in very similar ways. So we want to see some similarities here between Jacob and Esau's relationship to God and the events of their lives to our own lives. Well, as we hear Jacob and Esau's story today, there are a few things I'd like you to be listening to. All right? One is, what kind of relationship do Jacob and Esau have at the start of this story? Right? What is their relationship to each other, and how would you characterize that? I'd also like you to pay attention to how their relationship with one another is different at the end of the story. And I'd like you to give a little bit of thought to why you think that is. Or what does the story tell us that indicates what changed, right? Now, as I mentioned, uh, Jacob and Esau's story begins in Genesis chapter 25 which is where we're going to start. And uh, it's round about verse 19 that we're introduced to the story of two brothers. Brothers who are, are twins, in fact. And they're the children of Isaac and Rebekah, and we're told right at the start that Rebekah is barren. All right, so she's not been conceiving children. Uh, the story begins actually with a prayer. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Right? She's not having children. Isaac prays, Lord, please open Rebecca's womb. Please give us children. So we're told right away, or we're given right away, a reminder that God is the one who does life. Right? that God is the one who gives us children. He creates every single human person. He is the one who does life. And we're told that he answered Isaac's prayer by allowing Rebekah to conceive. Right? Now, right away we get a picture of Jacob and Esau's relationship because as Rebekah conceives as she has these two babies growing in her womb, they are jostling each other. They are literally fighting with each other. So much to the point that she's like, what is going on here? What is happening inside of me that there's so much turmoil, so much strife in my belly? Well, the Lord answers her uh, as we get to Genesis uh, 25, verse 23. The Lord answers her and he says this, Two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and, and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Right? So God is saying, so much is going on inside of you because in your belly are two different groups of people. There are two nations growing inside of you, and they are fighting with each other. They are struggling with each other, right? And the way this is going to turn out is that one of them is going to be stronger, but the one who is the older is going to end up serving the younger. Well, we see that this fight or this struggle continues even through the point that Jacob and Esau are born. Right? Esau is the one who gets out first. He's the older. Maybe he turns out to be the stronger too. Right? But Jacob is not far behind. Because even as Esau comes out, Jacob is grabbing onto his heel. You know, this is like two people trying to get through the door at the same time, right? You know, how does that work out? Kind of bumping shoulders and pushing your way through. And, and somebody makes it, but the other one's not far behind. All right? And it's almost like Jacob is saying, no, not quite, right? You may have gotten your head out first, but I am right here on your heel. Well, one of the things I think that's important as we come to this uh, part of the story is to understand 
the names that are given to Jacob and Esau, right? Because as we talked about before, names in the Bible always mean something. And they're given for certain reasons, right? Parents typically name their children based on either something that they know about the child already or some hope or expectation that they have for what their life will be, right? Well, in this case, Jacob and Esau's names are picked based on what's happening right there as they're born. And uh, I'd like to draw your attention to um, Esau's name. Now, we're told that when Esau came out, he was covered with hair. In fact, he was so hairy that he was like a garment, you know, like a hairy garment, maybe like a woolen sweater or something. Well, his parents named him Harry. Esau means hairy. You know, not like short for Harold, but covered with hair. So this is a kid who had like all of his chest hair and back hair and leg hair and probably all of this stuff right when he came out of the womb. But we're also told that he was all red, like the color of his body was red, and so they gave him a nickname, which is Edom, and Edom means red. So <clears throat> Esau's names described exactly what he looked like when he was born. Well, <clears throat> We're told, you know, the Lord said the older would serve the younger, and we see in that that um, Jacob really appropriated that promise. You know, he and even there coming out of the womb, he's grabbing onto the heel. He's saying, "Look, you're not going to get away from me. Probably, I'm going to end up subduing you one day." And when Jacob came out, he was given a name that described that particular action. Jacob, the name Jacob means grabby. In fact, uh, later in Hebrew, it was changed to mean heel grabber, right? So it means grabby, someone who grabs actually uh, because of who Jacob was and his situation and the fact that he was such a famous person in the, you know, in the history of the Hebrew people. They actually changed it to mean heel grabber. And this is a name that implies something. It implies a person who takes things that are not theirs. All right? And that is what we see here. Jacob is still trying to take what's not his. He comes out trying to take, you know, that role or that spot of the firstborn, even though he's not the one who actually got it. Well, we also see something about this that I'd like to spend just a minute on, which is these names almost set a bit of an expectation for their lives, right? Esau, if you can imagine, is the hairy, macho outdoorsman, right? And that's what he becomes, the hairy, macho, red-skinned outdoor type. Jacob, on the other hand, his name implies the conniving, sneaky deceiver. And that's who he turns out to be. So let's keep that in mind as we kind of progress through the story here. All right, so Jacob and Esau are born. We understand the circumstances of their birth and their delivery. And then the story moves forward. Uh, and starts talking about their relationship with their parents, right? And we're told right away that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob, right? So dad loves the hairy macho outdoorsman and mom loves the sneaky deceiver. Well, I mean, you can you can you know you can identify with this, right? The dads in the room who might be hairy, macho outdoorsmen. Um, you like your boy who's the little hunter. You like your boy who's rough and tumble and is always out there, um, you know, doing guy type things. And Rebecca loves Jacob, who turns out to be her little house helper, 
You know, we're told that he's always in the kitchen, he's always at the tents, he's always around kind of the women's areas, doing the women's work, and she loves her little house helper. Well, this kind of favoritism starts to build an animosity between the boys. As you can probably imagine, what happens when well, mom loves you more than she loves me. Well, dad loves you more than he loves me. Right? What happens when parents pick children? Mm-hmm. Has anybody been in a family where that was the case? You're right. not. You're <laughs> like a pretty child, aren't you? <laughs> right, so, you know, as you can imagine, there are some tensions that build there, right? There's, there's some, some difficulty and some animosity that builds up when you feel like one parent loves me or the other parent doesn't love me. So, you know, parents really don't do their families any favors, right, when they favor one child over another. Well, as we move on, we see that this tension and this animosity grows. Uh, Esau is the firstborn, so as the firstborn, he's entitled to some stuff, right? He has what's called a birthright, and this birthright means that he is the one who gets essentially the first divvying up of the stuff from mom and dad. And he's probably going to get a little bit bigger portion of it than any other kid. That's his birthright. Well, this is a, this is a tricky thing when you've got twins, right, who are seconds behind each other, right? They probably both feel like the firstborn. One thing we see is that Jacob kind of had his eyes set on this birthright. You know, he was grabbing Esau's heel as he came out. Uh, Their whole lives growing up, their whole time growing up, uh, Jacob seems to still be interested in this birthright. And it comes to a point in the story where we see that Jacob actually buys the birthright from his brother, but he doesn't do it like in an honest, straightforward way hey, you know, Esau, I really want this. It's got some value to it. Let's sit down and figure out how we can do this fairly, right? How can I give you an adequate compensation for what I'd like to have? That's not the way it goes. Jacob takes advantage of Esau. We're told that Esau was out in the fields. He's working hard. He comes in one day. He's famished, right? His brother's in the kitchen cooking some stew, cooking some lentil stew. And uh, so Esau comes in and he says, hey, give me some of that red stuff, right? Big macho outdoorsman, that red stuff. And, uh, you know, Jacob says, he sees how hungry his brother is. He sees how he's, you know, a little bit uh, impetuous at this particular point in time, how he's maybe willing to do something he wouldn't otherwise do because he has his eyes focused on what he wants and just getting that now. And um, Jacob says, ah, oh, well, here's my chance, right? So he tells his brother, well, first, just sell me your birthright. Esau says, look, I'm about to die, so what good is a birthright to me? And Jacob says, no, nah, swear to me first. So he swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to him. Then Jacob gave bread and lentil stew to Esau. Esau ate, drank, got up, and went away. And we're told, so Esau despised his birthright. Right? So he was fully taken advantage of, but it's not like he's innocent in the whole thing. I mean, he could have said no. Right? He could have just gone and probably taken the stew if he wanted to. But... The thing that we see here is this. Jacob is sneaky. He's the deceiver. He's the one who's conniving, and he's trying to figure out how he can really get what's not his and pretty much do it for nothing, right? Well, we're told that as a result of this, Esau despised his birthright. Well, guess who else he despised? Right, You ever do something, yeah, Jacob, right? You ever do something foolish, and right after you do it, you knew it was dumb? 
I have, like immediately, that is stupid. Well, have you ever been manipulated into doing something like that? Into something where as soon as you did it, you knew it was dumb, you knew you shouldn't have done it, and you knew that you got manipulated into it, right? How much more has that ever made you despise the person who manipulated you, right? Well, this is exactly what's going on here. My brother took full advantage of me. I was stupid to do it, but I did it. And now, I'm not only mad at myself, but I'm mad at him too. And I'm really mad because he should have known better. He should have done something differently, right? He shouldn't have treated me this way. But we also find that um, next, Jacob steals Esau's blessing. So he's not satisfied with just taking the birthright, but he has to also steal his blessing as the firstborn. Right? The one thing that Esau has left, the one thing that he didn't foolishly give away, is his dad's blessing. Well, Jacob has still, I guess, got his eyes on what else can I have, and we find that as Isaac, their dad, is getting older, and he says, I'm not sure exactly what day I'm going to die, but I know it's coming soon. He goes to Esau and he says, Hey, I love wild game, and I love the way that you cook it, and so here's what I want you to do. Go out and hunt and get some of that wild game that I love so much and bring it back and cook me that food that I really enjoy because I don't know how much longer I'm going to live and I want to give you my blessing and I want to enjoy uh, this great meal that you make before I do that. So, he saw goes, you know, he goes out into the hill country. He's going to be gone for a little while. And uh, he's going to do what his dad asked so that he can give his what he wants and then his dad can give him the blessing. Well, Rebecca, mom, overhears this. And guess what she does? She goes and grabs Jacob and she says, Hey, I've got a plan. I overheard your dad telling Esau this. And so she says to her son, listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau, and here's what he said. He said, go and hunt and get this game and make this food that I like, and I'll give you my blessing. So here's what we're going to do, all right? Go, you know, go get me two lambs, bring them back. I'm going to cook them up just the way your dad likes them. Uh, you put on your brother's clothes so that you'll smell like him. You know, your dad can't see so well anymore, and so he's not going to know whether it's you or your brother. But if you're wearing his clothes, then he'll probably think you're Esau. And um, Jacob says, hey, wait a second, Mom. There's going to be a problem here. You know, Esau's a hairy man, and I've got smooth skin. So... What happens when dad touches me? What happens when, you know, he puts his hand on me to bless me and he finds out then that I'm not my brother? She says, look, I've even got a plan for that. We're going to get goat skins and put them on your arms, all right? We're all set. Just go and do what I'm telling you. So, in the end, it works out. And Jacob actually gets the blessing by deceiving Isaac. Right? But who has been the main instigator in this whole thing? His mom. Right? So we see a little bit here how, yes, Jacob did turn out to be the sneaky deceiver, but also didn't we see something else? The acorn has not fallen far from the tree. Right? Some of this was given to him by his parents. The name set a bit of an expectation that he lived up to, but the environment in which he grew up, the way that his mom treated him, the way that she treated Esau, the way that their dad treated them, all of this played into who they became, how they turned into the people that they are. And we can see here 
how some of this sneakiness, how some of this deceit came to him honestly. His mom taught him how to do all this stuff. Well, Jacob ends up getting the blessing, and it makes Esau extremely angry. In fact, he comes in and he goes to his dad, and he's like, Dad, I'm here. I did all the stuff you want. He's like, who are you? Well, it's me. It's your son Esau. Well, weren't you just here? If this is really you, who would I give my blessing to? Dad, I can't believe it. What happened? <laughs> your brother got it. Your brother got it. Well, as a result of this, Esau is extremely angry, right? And we see that um, Esau is so angry with his brother, he wants to kill him. And Genesis 27 41 tells us, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, and I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. My dad's going to die soon, and when he dies, that's it for my brother. He's done. Well, Jacob is scared. He's really scared about what Esau might do to him. And guess who else is scared? Mom. Mom is scared. So Rebecca <coughs> devises a plan. And she says, hey, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go to my brother Laban that's far away. right? I'm going to tell your dad that we need to send you there because you need to get a wife. Um, you can stay there until your brother gets over his anger. And by the way, you do need to go get a wife. And you need to get a wife from my brother's house because I'll tell you what, I hate these local girls. Your brother has married them. They drive him crazy. I can't stand their ways. And I'll tell you what else. If you were to marry a girl from around here, life for me would not be worth living. You know, that's how much she despised the local women. And um, what's interesting about this is, you know, then they go ahead and she, she tells Isaac, hey, we need to send Jacob, we need to send him away to my brother's house because he's got to get a wife. She knows that. Um, it would just be awful for us if he married a local girl like his brother has done. And, um, you know, so he's really got to go. And <coughs> Esau overhears this. And we're told that when Esau overhears this, he immediately went to the house of Ishmael to get another wife for himself, a wife who would also be uh, in the line of their family, a descendant of Abraham. And I think that's kind of an interesting part of the story because I always figure it's like sometimes you don't know things until like your parents may assume that you know something or people may assume that you know something and you really don't know it until they tell you. And it's almost like uh, Esau over here, he married these girls, right? He had two wives by that time that we're told about. He married these girls maybe not really understanding that his parents didn't like that, but when he came to understand that it was a problem for them, he's like, oh, well, if they had just told me, I could have done something different. So he immediately goes and does something to try and please them. Well, again, Rebecca has uh, worked everything out. Um, she goes and makes preparation for uh, Jacob to leave. And so Jacob does. He goes on his way. And so where we're picking up with the story now is Jacob is traveling to Laban's house, right? He's going from the land where they are to where Rebekah's brother Laban lives, and this is basically in northern Iraq. And um, Jacob sets out on this journey, and something very interesting happens to him on the way, all right? There's a night where he camps, and he lays down to sleep, and he's laying there sleeping, and the Lord gives him a dream, right? And in this dream, God comes up and is standing right beside him and says this. I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land you're now sleeping on, 
Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I'm with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Well, Jacob wakes up from this dream, and he's really amazed. And he says, Well, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. So Jacob encounters God, is what happens at this part of the story. He's traveling from his home. He's running because he's scared. He's going to his uncle's house, and on the way, he encounters God. God comes to him in a dream, stands right next to him, and when he wakes up, he's amazed. Wow, I have encountered God. He is here. He is not far away. He's real. And I didn't realize it until now. Have you ever realized that God's here, but you just didn't realize it until a certain point in time came? And then, wow, I just became aware that God is here. Do you know that He's always here? God is always with us, He's always around us, He's always been active in the world, he's always here. We just don't always realize it. <coughs> well, Jacob realized it at that moment. He realized that God had come to him, that God was there with him, and that God is real. Well, Jacob, following the dream, continues on to his brother Laban's house. Or, I mean, to uh, his uncle Laban's house, right? And this is the beginning of a change in Jacob's life and a change in his character. It comes at the point following this dream, this, point, this time when he realized the presence of God, the reality of God. And we see that it develops through the next chapter of his life as he serves in his uncle Laban's house. Now when he gets there, you know that Jacob is the wily deceiver, the one who takes what's not his, the one who cheated his brother out of his birthright and his blessing. Well, Jacob is going to find that this is not only something passed on to and through his mother, but this is something that runs rampant in the family. All right? She got it honestly, too. And he's going to get a taste of his own medicine. He's going to learn what it's like to do this to other people because it's going to get done to him. Mm-hmm. Has God ever shown you what needs to change mm-hmm. by showing it to you and somebody else? Mm-hmm. By showing it to you by someone else doing to you the stuff that you've been doing? Mm-hmm. And then you're like, wow, I don't like that at all. <laughs> I I need to change, you know, I I, I shouldn't do that. Well, this is what's going to happen for Jacob. So, Jacob is greeted with open arms by his uncle. Oh, yes, come in, I'm I'm happy to have you. Oh, yeah, oh, and, and he immediately falls in love with one of Laban's daughters, Rachel. And Laban's like, oh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm happy to give you Rachel as a wife, but I just need you to do something for me, right? I need you to work for her. I need you to work for seven years in order to earn her hand in marriage. Seven years work for his wife, right? And he does it. And Jim's like, glad I didn't have to work seven years for her. I'll go if I'd be married now. Uh, uh, I'm kidding. That's, that, that's me. That's not Jim. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, so he does it, right? Jacob is happy. We're told Jacob is happy to work all this time. That the days fly by because he's so in love and he's so googly-eyed over Rachel that the time seems like nothing to him. 
And so the big day comes, the day of the wedding comes, and he's, you can imagine he's pretty excited, I would, I would think. And, um, you know, the tradition then is that you didn't see the bride. You know, like we, we, you're not supposed to see the bride until you're at the altar, you know, as far as we're concerned for a wedding. For them, you never saw the bride at all. Like she was covered head to toe, uh, you know, only could see her eyes. Um, she's kept in a separate tent. And it's like the whole wedding takes place, and you just have to trust that the girl behind the veil is the one, right, that's supposed to be there. Well, Uncle Laban does a little bait and switch on Jacob. And so Jacob goes through his whole wedding, and he wakes up the next day, and he lifts the veil, and it's not Rachel. It's Rachel's sister Leah, the one who we're told has lazy eyes, if that gives you any indication of the difference that he encountered. Right? So, this is, um, this is quite a shock to him, right? This is quite a shock to Jacob. I'm, you'd probably be a shock to you guys too, right? I, what happened to her? So he goes to Uncle Laban. He's like, Laban, Uncle Laban, what happened? Why have you given me Leah instead of Rachel? Uncle Laban says, oh, well, you know, it's not our custom to give the younger in marriage before the older. Didn't you know that? Right? No, it's not... That's not what was supposed to happen. It was supposed to be Rachel. I worked my seven years. What's going on? He said, hey, cool your jets. Hold your horses. Don't, you know, don't get so much in a fluster here. You're going to have her. Just finish the bridal week with Leah. I'll give you Rachel. And you'll have two wives. But I am going to need you to work for me for another seven years. <laughs> right? Well, what's he going to do at that point? Of course, of course I'll do it. Another seven years. Sure, just make sure it's Rachel this time, right? <laughs> so, you know, this, um, you know, during this time, you, get, you, have, you, have to imagine, you have to understand a couple things that are going on, right? Which is, Jacob turns out to be very gifted as a farmer, as a herdsman, right? He turns out to be uh, very good with the animals. And in that first seven years, Laban was becoming rich off of Jacob's work. And, in, and he knew he needed to keep him around, right? So this is that sneaky, conniving, deceitful way of keeping him around, making sure that I can still continue to benefit from all the good work that he's doing. And so Laban gets another seven years out of Jacob, right? And he's continuing to grow in wealth. He's con his flocks and herds are getting bigger and bigger. His animals are stronger, you know. And this is 14 years now that Jacob's working for him and doing a really good job. And so we kind of move through the story now, and we see that um, you know, Jacob has been growing Laban's flocks and herds, and at the same time, Jacob has been growing a family. Right? God has been giving him children. And he ends up in this uh, 14, or well, the this, this second seven year span, he ends up with 12 sons. Well, he ends up with 12 sons total. About 10 of them happen to be born during that seven years. And that's a pretty big family, right? And in addition to that, he has a daughter who we're told about. So at least 11 kids in his household. And Jacob starts to realize something. I have a lot of mouths to feed. I'm doing a lot of work. I'm not getting any benefit from this. What am I going to pass on to my kids? What land do I have? What do I have that I own? I'm, I have a lot of sons here who are going to come knocking on dad's door saying, what do you have for me? I'm going to start a family. And what have I got? I've got nothing. So Jacob goes to Laban and he says, hey, look, uncle, this has been great and all, but I have to go home, right? I need, to, I need to do something for myself. I need to do something for my family. And Laban says, no, 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 you can't do that, right? So they end up working out a deal. And the deal they work out is this. Laban wants to keep him around. Jacob needs to have something for himself. 
And so they agree that Jacob is going to take all of the animals from the flocks who are speckled or spotted or dark in color, right? And Laban's going to keep all the others. Now, what Jacob's getting is the smallest portion of the flock, right? The smallest number of animals have this kind of coloring to them, and the largest portion are the other one. But they make this decision, and they divide up the animals that way, and that's how they're going to keep track of who owns what, right? All right? Well, <clears throat> Jacob's flocks then grow, and Laban's flocks decrease. Now, Jacob's animals are stronger, and Laban's animals get weaker. And why is that? Because Jacob, who's the sneaky, wily deceiver, says, I know how to make the number of spotted and speckled and streaked and dark-colored animals increase, because I know to go and cut these branches and strip the bark off of them and put them near the water and then you know, certain animals are going to come and breed there and others aren't. And so I'm going to grow my possessions in this way. And Uncle Laban's not going to know that that's what I'm doing. And so that's what happens. Right? So Jacob starts building his own wealth out of his uncle's wealth. And he's doing it in a way that's not honest. He's doing it in a way that is deceitful. He says, but this is okay because it's really what's owed to me. This is okay because I've been taken advantage of, and so now I should only be able to take advantage of the one who's taken advantage of me, right? I'm only taking what should be mine already. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you work hard? but you don't get paid enough or you don't get treated right and so it's okay to go to the supply cabinet and take that box of pencils home right because it's only what's owed to you i know i'm glad you're shaking your head he works here at the church for anybody who doesn't know i'm glad he doesn't feel like you can go take the box of pencils home but um you know that's that's basically what it's like right this is owed to me it should be mine anyway. It doesn't matter if what I'm doing is dishonest because I'm really entitled to it. And that's not the way it should work, right? That's not the way that God wants it to work. Well, at the end of the day, Jacob does end up with a lot. And he gleans all of this out of uh, what his uncles had. And he decides, the time has come, I'm going home. But, based on the fact that my uncle and my cousins are really kind of aware at this point in time of what I've been doing, they really see how um, their wealth has decreased and mine has increased and they know that mine could only come out of theirs. They're a little bit upset about this, right? And so, um, <clears throat> Jacob decides, I'm going to have to do this, and I'm going to have to do it without them knowing. Right? So, he decides to pack everything up and leave without saying anything to anyone. Alright? Well, they get on down the road, so to speak, and Laban realizes they're gone. And when he realizes they're gone, he takes all of his men and he says, saddle up, boys. Let's go after them. And they do. And they catch up to Jacob. And so Jacob is pretty scared, right? I left my father-in-law. I took all my stuff. I took his daughters. I took his grandchildren. I never said goodbye. Um, he was angry with me anyway, and now he and all his men are right here on my heels. What are they going to do? Well, the Lord steps in at this point. The Lord steps in and talks to Laban. And we see in Genesis 21-34, 
that God says, God comes to Laban, and he talks to him in a dream. God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night, and he said, watch yourself, God warned him. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Watch yourself. Don't say anything to him, either good or bad. Essentially, hold your anger and your words, Laban, and let them go. Don't say anything to him. Well, Jacob and Laban make peace after this, and they part ways. Jacob is continuing on his trip back home. Laban returns to his household. And so Jacob has avoided this potential blow-up with his uncle, with his father-in-law. But then he realizes, wait a second, I'm headed home. And when I get home, who's there waiting for me? Hmm. Esau. Esau. Esau is there. And Esau's anger burned so strongly right before Jacob left that he was saying, as soon as Dad's dead, I'm, ta I'm taking care of my brother. Right? Well, guess what? He's going right back into that now. So, <clears throat> what we see is that as Jacob is getting close to home, he sends messengers on ahead to kind of feel things out. Say, well, let me see what's going on with my brother and how, how he's really going to receive me. Well, when... When um, when Esau's or when Jacob's messengers come back, they tell him this: Your brother Esau is coming, and he's got four hundred men with him. Right? That's a huge number of people to bring as a welcoming party, right? So they say, "We went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you with four hundred men. Four hundred men." What reason on earth does Esau have to bring 400 men with him unless he's planning to fight his brother? And at least that's what Jacob thinks, right? So Jacob makes a plan. Jacob says, look, I'm going to divide into two groups. I'm going to have one group that goes this way and one group that goes that way. And then maybe um, if he attacks one, the other will survive. Right? This is our strategy for dealing with the situation. And he also says, but I'm going to do something else. I'm going to send gifts to my brother. I'm going to send gifts to ho hopefully um, ingratiate myself to him and placate his anger a little bit. Right? So he's, he starts taking from his flocks and his herds and he's sending abundant gifts on ahead and servants who are to say, Oh, this is a gift from your servant Jacob. Not your brother Jacob, your servant Jacob, right? Who humbles himself before you and gives you this gift. Oh, wonderful and powerful brother Esau, right? So hopefully you won't be angry with him and you won't kill him, <laughs> right? Well, Jacob does something else besides making his plan. He does something else besides just uh, saying, let's go into two groups and let's um, send these gifts ahead to my brother. Jacob prays. Jacob prays, and he says this. God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family, and I will cause you to prosper. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. Look at that for a minute. The Lord who said to me, go back to your land and to your family. God, you told me to do this, and I'm doing it. I'm obedient to you. I'm calling on your name, and I'm calling you by the promise that you gave me, by the instruction that you gave me. I'm unworthy of all of your kindness and faithfulness. I'm not worthy. You are kind and you are faithful, and I'm not worthy of it. And he goes on to say, Indeed, I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two camps. Please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid of him. 
Otherwise, he may come and attack me, the mothers and the children. Right? Rescue me. God, who is faithful and kind, whose faithfulness and kindness I don't deserve, rescue me. Jacob calls on the Lord. He takes his fear, his worry, and his concern, and he puts it in front of God. Right? I don't deserve anything. I'm not worthy of your kindness. I'm afraid of my brother. I know you can help. Please rescue me. I know you're faithful. And you'll do it. And then something very remarkable happens here. Jacob hangs back by himself in the camp. He sends everyone on across the river, and he's alone as night comes. And a mysterious man appears on the scene. We're not told who the man is, but we are told that Jacob wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that it was wrenched. And the man said, let me go. And Jacob said, no, not until you bless me. And the man asked, well, what's your name? Jacob, he replied. And the man said this, your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Your name will no longer be Jacob, it will be Israel. And that's exactly what Israel means. You have struggled with God and with men. This is where Jacob's name changes. This is where God says, you're no longer the heel grabber. You're no longer the deceiver. Those names may have been who you were, but they're not who you are. Not when you're struggling with me. That's not who you are when you seize me and don't let go. When you wrestle with man and God, you will prevail in me, you will overcome. If you are holding on to me. Do you understand this is exactly the promise that we have in Jesus Christ? Amen. Jesus, who is both man and God. The one who is God, the eternal and everlasting Son, and who is Jesus of Nazareth. The man who lived and died and was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. God has saved us by uniting himself with us. Living our life, dying our death, being raised to the new life that we can have after death if we hold on to him, no matter how intense the struggle to hold on to him may become. With him and we don't let go, we will prevail because he has prevailed. And, you know, in response to this, Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, and I have been delivered. I have seen God face to face, and I have been delivered. When we see Jesus, when we know Jesus, we see God face to face, and we are delivered. We are delivered by the one whose name means deliverer. The one who is named Deliverer because he is the one who will deliver his people from their sins. Our lives are spared through Jesus. They are changed forever. And our relationships are changed as well. Just as we see with Jacob and his brother, we may be expecting, and Jacob is expecting, to return to his brother and be met by war, to be met by anger and vengeance, right? But that morning, Jacob and Esau met again for the first time in over 20 years. And Jacob bowed down to the ground seven times as his brother was approaching. Please don't kill me. 
and Esau was running to him. Esau threw his arms around him and kissed him. I love you, brother. I'm not mad about anything. The Lord has taken care of it all, and I'm just happy to see you. Mm. Well, not only was Jacob transformed as a person, not only was he given a new name, but his relationship with his brother was transformed. Amen. It was transformed by the grace of of a loving God. So this is what we learn about God through the story. That God is loving. And that God transforms us so that we can love in the way He loves. He loves in a way that transforms relationships. That repairs the rift. That removes the grudge. That replaces deceit with trust. And God's love has been shown by sending the Son into the world to repair our relationship to Him and to each other. And this is what we remember and what we celebrate when we take communion. Let's pray.